Hello, I am Connor Dara, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. Today, I'm once again joined by Christopher Tomalkey. How are you doing, Christopher? Hi, uh, good. Connor, how about you? Not too bad. Um, and today, we'll be discussing the resurgent movement mm-hmm. of Scottish independence. Um, so, as everyone knows, in 2014, Scotland held a referendum on whether or not to leave the UK. They voted 45 to 55 to remain. It was voted on by 84.6% of eligible voters at the time. And it was built up as a um, a once in a generation vote. The the British government at at the time, led by David Cameron, Nick Clegg, under the coalition, um, along with Ed Miliband, who was the leader of the opposition at that point, um, sort of banded together to in a Remain campaign. They they promised to give the uh, Hollywood, which is the Parliament in Scotland, more uh, devolved power, and they promised that. Scotland would be able to control its own taxes and VAT numbers, and that it would be a main member in the EU. The main reason against or for Scottish independence at the time was the control of the budget uh, of the NHS and uh, education and whatnot, which Westminster were told at the time, and the fact that Scotland wanted a constitution, which of course the UK is only one of three countries on the on the earth that does not have one. And then all that changed again. In 2016, when the Brexit referendum in the UK gave Scotland a lifeline, so what happened there, Christopher? So in the 2016 Brexit election, um, Scotland, uh, as you all know, is mainly known for its pro-European stance, uh, if you'd like to say that. And uh, on the day, I mean, this wasn't really taken into consideration beforehand how other provinces of the UK would vote in comparison to England. But... Scotland voted overwhelmingly to uh, remain within the EU. Uh, it was a margin of 38% to 62%. The numbers in total being 1,018,322 wanted to leave and the remain being 1,661,191. That, that's a huge difference, uh, a huge you know, imbalance. It's almost a difference of around... Well, it is a, dis- a difference of around 600,000. And it was quite remarkable, actually. I remember I was watching the election, the, the night the results were coming out. And um, the main topic that night shifted from what will the UK do whenever they leave the EU to how will the UK remain together, especially when Scotland voted so overwhelmingly uh, to leave. So that also uh, obviously gave a bit of a, a boost in the polls for Scottish independence drastically, as as we've seen over the last couple of years, especially under the Theresa May government. Yeah, Theresa May was, was quite famously a quite disastrous government and replaced by another government that's been very uh, negative towards Scotland with Boris Johnson's government. So, like, how, how have, like, the Conservatives been recently seen in Scotland? Well, the Conservatives have been actually quite low in the polls. If... For example, we take the Holyrood elections that are supposed to be coming in May time, um, 2021. Uh, we can see that the SNP are due to win 100 or 71 out of the 129 seats in the Scottish Parliament, which is a remarkable win for the Scottish Nationalist Party, while the Conservatives sit at 17 seats and Labour at 21. So actually, it's, it's a much larger loss for the Conservatives in Scotland, or it's anticipated to be a much larger loss in support for the Conservatives in Scotland as they're down by roughly 14 seats, opposed to Labour losing generally around three seats. Yeah, so um, the SNP currently have, I think, 63 seats in Hollywood? They do, just short of a majority by two. And that's actually a higher number than they had uh, in 2014 when they went in for the referendum? Yes, it it was. I think the last time they had a majority was under Alex Alex Salmond, um, if I'm correct. I think he had a very slim majority of 67 seats in 2014, possibly. That was after the referendum, yeah. I think that might have been before the referendum. Was I remember seeing the there was the seat change in the, the overall UK general election in Scotland, and I think the SNP in like 2012 or 2010 maybe it went from like. Uh, it was like five seats, a very low amount, to controlling all but one or two in the in the next election. Yeah, definitely. If we if we look at the twenty nineteen general election for an example, we could see in the last one as many people were anticipating, the SNP had a huge sur- uh, surge in support, bringing them up to forty eight out of fifty seven seats available in Scotland, which was truly remarkable for the independent Scotland movement.
both the Conservatives and Labour were completely wiped off the board. There was little to no opposition, as as we've seen, um, and the SNP till this day continue to dominate the political landscape in Scotland. Funny is that Labour, 20 years ago under Tony Blair, they controlled almost every seat in Scotland, and now they're almost completely irrelevant in, in, the, in the country. And even just the other day, the, the leader of the Scottish uh, Labour Party, he resigned just a few months before the election, which is not when you want to see a leader resign. Definitely not. And, you know, these results that we've seen in the 2019 general election undoubtedly did renew the intensifying calls for a second Scottish independence uh, referendum. But this time, as we are aware, Nicola Sturgeon is now leading the charge opposed to Alex Salmond. This wasn't the first time the SNP were able to grasp a majority of constituencies under Nicola Sturgeon's leadership. She's quite popular, as we're aware. They were also able to obtain 35 seats in the 2017 general election, which is just above a majority of constituencies in Scotland voting in favour of the SNP. Quite remarkable that. In 2017, just a year after the Brexit referendum, the Scottish Parliament approved something called Section 30. And Section 30 is the process to get a a legal referendum in Scottish independence in, in Scotland. And in 2014, it works by Westminster approving certain powers to Hollywood to devolve government of either Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, in this case Scotland, uh, to do something that they would not otherwise have the power to do. And in 2017, Hollywood passed a section 30, but Westminster have not passed their own version of it, which of course means that they haven't been granted the power to, to hold one. And the difficult thing is a referendum is not a legally binding vote. So it's unknown what the SNP can do. They could probably hold a referendum, but of course it wouldn't be legally binding, and a referendum like that would probably be boycotted by the Labour and the Conservative Party, which would then pretty much make it pointless because no one's going to approve something like that. But like, what are the um, polls for Scottish independence at the minute? Well, the polls are... Well, they have been shifting ever since Boris Johnson took office as Prime Minister... We were looking at the 2019 um, a 2019 poll conducted by the Sunday Times, spanned over from the 18th to the 20th of June. Uh, this was the first poll with Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. The sample size was, on, uh, was, was 1,024. Now, this poll showed that a majority of people, by a very slim margin, were in favour of remaining within the United Kingdom. 46% wanted to leave the United Kingdom and 6% did not know. If we compare this to the poll findings of the Lord Ashcroft poll on the 30th of July, uh, on the 2nd of August, uh, we could see that the majority had became people in favour of Scottish independence. So it was now 46% in favour of Scottish independence, 43% in favour of remaining in the UK, and 12% in like were unsure whether they wanted to remain or leave. The sample size was was 1019. If we skip to, you know, today, the most recent poll conducted by the Sunday Times, which gained quite a lot of traction in the newspaper, showed that 49% of people were in favour of Scottish independence. A sample size of 1,206. The no was way down to 44%. Don't know 7%. So I remember reading about this all over the news. It also conducted a poll in the north uh, regarding Irish unity too. Yeah, and I think was there. I think it was over 20, 21 consecutive polls showing majority support for independence. There was and, yes. Yeah, and of course Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, she's very popular in Scotland, especially after uh, she's been widely praised from even people like Piers Morgan for her pandemic response. She's actually, she got an approval rating of plus 24. She's the only leader in Scotland with a positive approval rating at the minute. And she does make support for Scottish independence more likely if they're going to enter in a new era in their history with a, a popular leader that they, they do support. Definitely. I mean, when we look back again at the 2019 general election, although in some ways it was a pretty defeating general election for Labour, in other ways it was pretty good for the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon believed that this would be a large enough mandate to receive a second independence referendum. I remember on the, the panel 
whenever the exit poll was first revealed, one of the main topics talked about in particular was the likelihood of Scottish independence after, you know, the SNP had received such a huge surge in support. Although the thumping majority obtained by the Conservatives and Boris Johnson planted position on Scottish independence saw no such mandate fulfilled over the years subsequent to that but rather completely ignored and downplayed. I, I don't think that that is anything different from Boris Johnson. Um, he tends to, you know, he tends to completely ignore any type of credible arguments or type of evidence in favour of things he does not agree with. So, yeah, subsequent to, to this election, support for Scottish independence actually continued to soar. As Nicola Sturgeon's approval reading, uh, reading, as we were talking about there, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, also continued to, um, to increase drastically. Yeah, the, Boris Johnson, of course, did his rather infamous Sea of the Union tour of Scotland a few months ago. And he all he did was visit two very pro-Tory towns on the outskirts and the coast of of Scotland. And actually, after he, he, after he came, the, the polls for independence actually improved. And he, his obstruction and his position on it is actually quite incredible, considering the, the support, especially this is a guy who's constantly said that you have to respect the people's vote of the 2016 referendum when Jeremy Corbyn was saying about holding another one and Juice Winston was talking about just not leaving. And it's incredible considering that the SNP has such substantial support in Scotland that he is denying this inevitable thing to happen. Definitely. Just rewinding it slightly back there to Brexit, Connor. Um, as we've seen in the, the Brexit election, many people have, in, in Scotland particularly, have this overriding sense of Scottish nationalism and Scottish identity, especially European identity. And I think one of the large factors also that played a role in, you know, Scotland's want, Scotland wanting to remain within the, the EU and not wanting, and wanting independence in terms of the poll surging was the undeniable neglection of Scotland in the um the early 20, uh, 21st century in terms of Tony Blair was a new a new canvas. Margaret Thatcher had done quite a lot of damage to Scotland by industrialising and killing off a lot of its old industries. And Tony Blair, um, people had hope for Tony Blair. And whenever he continued the same type of attitude as Margaret Thatcher almost in a more sneaky way, he also did quite a lot of damage to Scotland. And that's whenever Scottish independence basically started to to pick up a, a drive. Well, I think I say this for you there, because I think Tony Blair was the one who implemented the, dev- the devolution in Scotland and Wales, Northern Ireland. And he did, yes, but uh, it was this whole... Um, idea regarding the financial services in London that has dominated the early 21st century politics in Britain regarding... No, I, I, know um, what you're, I know what you're getting yeah. at because Scotland, they aren't able to control their own taxes or finances. That's a job for Westminster. But I think going back to Brexit, one of the major things, one of the promises of the 2014 referendum was that Scotland would remain a leading member in the EU because I think at that point uh, the UK was the president of the EU or held the presidency and the they were the second largest economy behind Germany. They might be in the first at that point. And that kind of gave a lifeline to Scottish independence because it was a once in a generation. I'd say both sides agreed on that at the, at the time. Definitely. There, there were many different many different factors that obviously played into the, uh, the sudden, well, not sudden, it was the slow erosion of that British identity uh, in Scotland. Yes, and I think just to discuss the major issues on both sides like there's of course the the trident nuclear miss- missile system which is in scotland and of course the the, the smp want that removed but of course it's very difficult to move nuclear weapons um and that was one of the sticking points of the the 2014 referendum another thing was i find interesting is of course the uk has no constitution only israel and new zealand are the only other two countries on the planet that don't have a constitution and scotland wanted one uh, for the UK, but of course the UK wasn't going to give one. That was another reason they wanted independence. On the constitution there, Connor, there has been large calls, especially for Keir Starmer, the current leader of the opposition, to engage more in radical uh, constitutional change to the United Kingdom. This obviously entails uh, many different scenarios. I, th- I think that if the UK were to try and exist to any type of degree, just say the scenario uh, ended up that Scotland... In fact, by this is probably a very rare scenario. Scotland wanted to remain within the the UK. There would need to be quite a lot of constitutional change. That might be a way to actually see the union is to call for like a constitutional convention to to do that. But of course, there are, there are reasons for the EU to also or for Scotland. Sorry, for Scotland to actually stay in the UK. And I think the big one is of course the National Health Service, 
which is one of the most popular institutions in the UK. And of course, it's very di- be very difficult for Scotland to set up their own independent one in a scenario where they do leave the UK. Definitely. And another one of the, the arguments that people in favour of Scotland remaining in the UK have utilised is the idea that Scotland would be unable to hold its own in a growingly, you know, a world that's uh, in more economic turmoil as days pass due to COVID-19. And, you know, Scotland and the rest of the UK are already set to have quite a large recession. So people are keeping in mind the economic difficulties there may be in terms of uh, having an independent Scotland. Yes, and the UK actually has the worst recession from the pandemic in Europe. And of course, I saw, I saw the other day that Scottish independence could cost Scotland £11 billion pounds a year which is a relatively unsustainable amount, especially for a, a country that's just trying to get off its feet, or get on its feet, sorry. And, of course, another another issue is currency, because the, the UK have said that should they leave, Scotland would not be allowed to use the, the sterling anymore. But you would think that wouldn't be a problem because they would likely just join the Eurozone. But, of course, that would be a process, and uh, in that period, there wouldn't be a currency, an official currency in Scotland. There is definite talks regarding that, whether Scotland will adopt the Euro or whether it will um, it will have its own its own currency. I think what's remarkable regarding the currency argument is that, as many recall, whenever Ireland um, first gained independence, it actually continued to use the same currency as Britain for a very uh, uh, substantial period of time until it switched to, um, I I think, the euro. I think that might have been a switch. I'm not too sure um, if there was a period of time within that in which they did adopt a different currency. Yeah, of course, uh, the, the, argument against, a, against, the argument against that is, of course, that surely there could just be a transition period where Scotland sort of ease out the using of the pound. Uh, yeah, that's definitely um, on the talks in terms of the transition period would probably be beneficial in terms of actually establishing a hard border because, as we know, there will need to be a hard border between England and Scotland in the event of an independent Scotland. Yeah, and uh, just think, any, any closing thoughts on Scottish independence, Christopher? Not uh, too many. I just I'd like to add uh, one last point. Uh, and whenever it comes down to uh, that sense of British identity in Scotland, many people prior to this didn't really have much of a British identity anyway. Scotland has always been famously uh, known for its own sense of uh, of culture, and I think it's important for people to keep that in in mind regarding Scotland. Scottish people are very proud of of their heritage, and uh, so they should be. So the culture might be a very um, large factor in uh, the independence vote. Thank you. Uh, I think that, that concludes the podcast this week. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Christopher, for joining me.